The most deviant, dangerous killers, according to the research of Dr. Stone, are motivated by one thing, torture. For them, violence is actually arousing. These urges lead to the most sadistic crimes. Crimes like those of Wesley Dodd. Like Jerome Brudos and Jeffrey Dahmer, Wesley Dodd saw his victims as objects. And like David Parker Ray, Dodd was fueled by the pain he could inflict on his victims. But unlike these other killers, Wesley Dodd targeted children. Raise your right hand. Do you swear the evidence you're about to give us the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so we got What would be your intention if you're forced to live in prison? Do everything I can to escape, and if necessary, kill prison guards on the way out, and I'll go right back to doing what I did before as soon as I hit the streets. Which is what? Kill kids. Kill and rape kids? Yes. So you should be executed for the safety of others? Yes. The crimes of Wesley Dodd are so cruel, so meticulous and brutal, that he'd be considered as one of the most deviant, most evil killers. Wesley Dodd fantasizes about the most helpless victims, dreaming up new ways to abuse and kill. For years, he documents his sadistic plans. What would compel him to carry out such horrifying schemes? Like Jerome Brudos and Jeffrey Dahmer, Dodd's deviant behavior may also be linked to his childhood. 1961, Washington State. Dodd is born into a cold, unloving home. There was really never any love in the family at all. Uh, I don't remember ever hearing the words, I love you. I don't remember ever saying them. At school, Wesley is bullied by classmates. He is a loner. At a young age, he develops an interest in exhibitionism. From his bedroom window, he exposes himself to passing school children. But as he gets older, he becomes more dangerous. He begins to abuse boys. He stalks playgrounds and arcades, luring his victims with the promise of money. By the age of 25, he abuses over 30 children. He is caught in the act several times and punished with brief stints in jail. Despite, or perhaps even because of the punishment, his fantasies became more extreme his thoughts now include torture, murder, and cannibalism, which he outlines in his diary. Elaborate fantasies turn into detailed plans. So I started planning, writing in the diary. He finds a park to carry out a plot to rape and murder, an area he calls his hunting ground. Fall, 1989. Dodd stops two brothers in the park and leads them to an isolated spot. He kills them both. Dodd records the details of the murders in his journal with an alarming note. He gets more of a high out of killing than molesting. There is a turning point for Dodd. He discovers that violence, more than anything else, provides the ultimate gratification. He finds his next victim, a four-year-old, alone in a playground. He takes the boy home and spends the next 12 hours abusing him. The next morning, he strangles the victim to death and hangs the body in a closet. He takes photographs and continues to abuse the corpse before leaving for work. Later, he disposes of the body near a lake and keeps an item of the child's clothing in his briefcase as a souvenir. Dodd's deviance progresses even further. His new plan is to design and build a torture rack for his next victim. Dodd tries to abduct a boy at a local movie theater, but is caught in the act. Dodd confesses to his crimes. He appears cold, devoid of any emotion. When police ask him why he killed, Dodd fails to come up with a clear answer. I think I've thought a lot about, I don't know why Dodd was started with. You know, I've been lost some kids for 12 or 13 years. I've never done anything violent at all. 
In January 1990, Dodd pleads guilty on all counts of murder and asks to be hanged, the way he killed his final victim. Wesley Dodd is executed by hanging in 1993.